a soldier at war I know you've seen my face before I am red, white and blue I am black and brown and yellow too I have killed and I have died All alone and damaged deep inside And the child Sacrifice for some insanity Left the boy, now half a man My innocence was lost in a foreign land Fought so hard and I fought so long I fought for my country right or wrong In the eye Spangled banner did I see There is blood on the water It's flowing like the blood inside of me In smoke-filled rooms the men of might Will send your son somewhere to fight And I am one of many more Just pawn in the holy war In a field where the food used to grow There's a murder of crows Now the war is dead and gone But the battle goes on and on And the dream that used to be Is buried so deep inside of me I believed what I was told but all that glitters is not gold I still see my brother's hand why he died I'll never understand I'm a soldier at war I know Just the name and loaded gun One more lost forsaken son I'm a soldier at war I'm a soldier Well, this is uh, Dan Shea with uh, Veterans for Peace Forum. Uh, uh, I just wanted to uh, do a shout out to uh, Kelly Labonte, our producer, who is really, this show is her baby, uh, invited me uh, a few years back to come on the program and, and put a veteran's voice to uh, the issues that, <coughs> that uh, were important to veterans while these uh, wars and occupations were going on in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq. And, uh, to, you know, she just last week I found out that she had uh, uh, got pneumonia. She's in the hospital. Just talked to her a few minutes ago. Uh, and she's, re you know, we're doing this show because she's, this is her baby, and she we wanted to, to continue the show for her. She hopefully she'll be out of the hospital soon. I'll try and get over and see her tomorrow. Um, 
her partner Jim Lockhart is uh, running the studio by himself uh, along with Frank uh, who's been over at uh, uh, Portland Community TV and he came out here to help us today so I want to thank him uh, for showing up and taking Kelly's spot for today uh, today uh, you know last time we had uh, Zach on our program Zachy uh, Bucharest who served in the uh, Israeli military and there's so much that uh, we wanted to get said and we just couldn't do it. Uh, there's too many things going on. But we also needed another voice. So we needed the Palestinian voice in this uh, conversation. So I've invited uh, Wael al uh, right. from uh, He's a Palestinian-American student of Middle East Studies at Portland State University. He's also the co-founder of uh, Students United for Palestinian Equal Rights and a board member um, of uh, American United for Palestinian Rights and a member of the Portland Boycott Divestment Sanctions Coalition. Welcome to the program. Thanks for having us. So, you know, uh, when, I, when I was talking about this program, one of the things, both of you guys are friends, you both go to the PSU, and, mm -hmm. and uh, so one of the things that I wanted to get to is here <clears throat> with all these conflicts between Israel and Palestine, uh, the solutions for peace have always been very difficult uh, to talk about these issues. I mean, I had to go back and, and uh, I was reading a book called uh, Broken Promises uh, and Broken Dreams, Stories of Jewish and Palestinian Trauma of, Re of Resilience and by Alice Rothschild. This is a book uh, you should pick up uh, to sort of get a perspective of a young woman who went back in her teens uh, with her parents to Israel, fell in love did Aliyah to uh, Israel later in life, studied medicine, became a doctor, and was pretty much a, a strong Zionist pos a position there at that time. And uh, through that, she, she became, as a doctor, she started uh, uh, dealing with people in the sort of feminist movement. Feminist movement led her into doing actions of peace. Uh, she would go in and be treating uh, Palestinians along with Israelis. And she began to question some of the things that were happening, especially, she said, uh, I think, in, um, uh, when the Intifada took place, the first Intifada, questions were beginning to rise in her mind and what she was being told. And then, uh, of course, uh, uh, when they invaded in uh, the refugee camps in uh, Jordan. Uh, these, these things uh, left a deep impression on a lot of Israelis that uh, something had gone terribly wrong. Um, they weren't living up to their own self-image. And uh, so she became involved with a, a, a number of groups of peace movements who were, were working with Palestinian and Jew, Jewish <clears throat> doctors, and they created, um, I forget the names of the groups, but one of the groups later she gets involved is uh, with uh, Jewish Voices for Peace. And uh, they had medical clinics that were going into uh, uh, the West Bank uh, in the rural areas and, and then working with hospitals within uh, Gaza. Um, so it, it was, it's just an interesting evolution and transition. So she tells a story of a Palestinian doctor that she's working with and these stories of these families and how at some point, you know, she's t listening to the story of a Palestinian uh, woman telling about how her child was killed and, uh, and or I can't remember if it was a male or female, but uh, the parent who had lost a child and still was treating other, <clears throat> I think it was, no, it was an Israeli parent whose child had been killed by a, a uh, uh, suicide bomber. And in the papers it had said that uh, the mother said she was proud of her son, uh, he was a martyr and that he had uh, killed five Israelis plus this young kid. And uh, his father was saying that his son was just a young kid going to school, not yet ready for the military, but would be going soon. And, uh, but he, as a doctor, he could not exhibit hate. And he, although that hurt him very much to hear the mother say that, he was, uh, he still felt he had a duty to, to protect all human life. And this, this whole thing just made her, you know, think about how can somebody who people have been killing each other, how do you stop revenge? How do you stop uh, how do you stop this idea of this sort of feudal uh, mentality among people? There are legitimate rights why people fight and defend themselves. There are legitimate rights uh, uh, for all nations, you know, to do that. Um, but the question is, how do individual people, how do we come to it? I'm with Veterans for Peace, and I fought in a war 
<clears throat> in Vietnam. Uh, we have our veterans going to uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. They've been in Grenada and Panama and various places in Korea. And many of us have just come to the position that we will no longer support or, or fight in these conflicts. Uh, we, for many have become COs or pacifists. Um, and just as us as human beings, we begin to see that, uh, you know, who's leading us to these wars? Who's the people on top that are uh, going for land and nation and uh, patriotism, these ideas of creating who we are? And we began to see that, at least I began to say that we're all of the same family and we're all human beings on this earth. And, um, you know, I lost a child uh, uh, due to um, uh, Agent Orange and the congenital heart disease and everything else that, that took my son when he was only three years old. And the grief that I felt in losing that child was incredibly, uh, uh, I mean, it, was, it sent me through an abyss of pain and sorrow that my whole world just, you know, was pulled out from underneath me. And through that pain, I began to realize, you know, what about the pain of the mother and father in Vietnam? What about those people in Iraq or Afghanistan, or the Palestinian or the Israeli parent that loses? And it became not about these national issues, but about these real human issues of pain. And that I could no longer uh, uh, support any idea of, of nation and war and all of these things. So I wanted to get down to the sort of basic things that are affecting you. Um, you guys are going to school together. You, uh, he's a he's a friggin' Israeli military before. How did you guys get together? <laughs> you know, uh, he's a Palestinian. What the heck? I thought you guys were uh, uh, crawling up the people in Gaza and shooting people at the checkpoints. Uh, so, I want to know. You know, what is it? What brought you two together? Or what what is the evolution of of process here? I mean, I think, you know, for me, I think the, the answer to that question, I think, is, is, is really telling because I think it really goes to the heart of what's going on and in the sense that, in the sense that a Palestinian American and, you know, and as, you know, former Israeli soldier can come together in the United States and, and can be friends. And, and the answer to that is, is kind of the answer, I think, to, to what the root of what's going on in Palestine and Israel and that it's not cultural, it's not religious uh, differences, uh, it's, it's not, uh, you know, it, it, it's not some kind of psychological difference between Israelis and Palestinians. But to be blunt, I mean, it, it comes down to the fact that we have both American citizenship. <laughs> I have an Amer American passport and Zaki has an American passport. And what does that mean for me? That means when I interact with Zaki, as a former IDF soldier, uh, you know, in the United States, that, that you know, I, I don't have to deal with. I, I deal with Zaki as an equal, you know, but before the law, I deal with Zaki as somebody who's not holding a gun and, and manning a checkpoint and asking me and my family to uh, show. You know, I, I don't deal with Zaki as a settler who's taking my land, who's who's able to do that with the support of the law and the state. Um, and, and, uh, and I mean, obviously, there's more to mine and Zaki's relationship. We have a lot of the same interests. Our politics are close, but quite frankly, I have friends that are Zionists. Um, it's a little bit more of a difficult relationship, but at the very, I, I have acquaintances that, that are, that are Zionists, Zionists and, and we are able to have civil conversations and uh, we're able to, you know, go out. One of my best friends actually in Arizona is, is I would say, a soft Zionist, but, but nonetheless, he's, he's very supportive of, of a lot of the policies of Israel that I'm I'm completely what do you opposed mean to by that? Uh, a soft Zionist. Soft but what I mean by that is, you know, he, he's he's kind of critical um, of of some of the policies. The idea that Israel goes a little bit too far, but you know, really, there, it's a cycle of violence and, and this long thing that's existed for a long time, and, and they have some rights. But nonetheless, the point is, I'm able to be. He's my best friend. He was the best man at my wedding. Oh. The, the point is. Here we have the same rights, though. I, I can deal with him as an right, equal, right. and I think that's the root of it. Well, that's good. And, and he's met, we both mentioned the word Zionist. Uh, could you give a definition of Zionism and, and what it means? <clears throat> because I, I, have, uh, I have friends that would call themselves Zionists, mm -hmm. but would not be really supportive of the actions against 
uh, Palestinians and uh, the occupied territories, uh, and they they would consider their Zionism spiritual Zionism. You know, so maybe you might think about well, it that way. If you want to talk about a Zionism that exists as a state entity and yeah. ideology, you would have to argue that it, it it's the uh, fundamental belief that. Israel slash Palestine includes Jerusalem is the homeland for Jews and no one but the Jews as it was 2,000 years ago and it's their ultimate God-given right to go there, settle there, live there regardless of whoever is there. Um, and that's essentially the, 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 base, the basis of what Zionism is. And the whole ideas of Zionism, I don't, the whole reaction of the world <coughs> after the Holocaust seem to justify what had happened to the Jews, right? But this, this was something that had happened before that. The whole, the whole colonization of, of Israel of, by Eastern Europeans, Russian Jews, other smaller you know, groups of, 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 of Jews that were not Palestinian Jews, because there was a, 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 mm -hmm. a, a, a population in Jerusalem, there was a population in, um, um, yeah, what was it called? Beersheba or someplace. I mean, there's all over. It's it, everyone lived right. there. There's no, there's no real. This is this kind of land or that kind of land. It wasn't. It wasn't. It didn't have a definition, so to speak, save for um, imperial definitions as it being part of the Ottoman Empire or being part of the British Empire or being part of something else. So it, it, it when you, when you look at it within those terms, it seems that that whole particular location has always been plagued by some form or label of Outsiders of an outside an outside uh, 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 power dynamic, but then uh, Herschel was uh, sort of the the leader of the idea of of, of creating the uh, Israeli state. Herzl, Herzl, yeah. Herzl. and uh, I mean, there's the 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 idea of of, uh, of a state for for Jews to go to was one thing after the Holocaust, but now. In the beginning ideas of, of the building of Israel was the idea of creating a democratic state. Uh, I mean, there were some really high ideals in the very beginning uh, of, of the beginning of Israel. In fact, I remember seeing some early magazines which seemed, it wasn't just for Jews, it was for everybody to be there. It was going to be a state that would grow the ideal kind of democracy in the Middle East. But then it becomes now, I mean, uh, there seems to be this sort of idea that it's... Uh, uh, at least by the more hard uh, right uh, is they want a theocratic state, a Jewish state. And then we get into a different kind of definition. Uh, there, I mean, there are Israelis and Jews. This is, you just said earlier that this is not a war between Jews and, and uh, Palestinians. It's not, a, it's not between uh, religion. Uh, uh, people also have the idea in, in this context of today that Palestinians are uh, 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 Islam, you know, the religion of Islam, and uh, and they look at Iraq and Afghanistan. But Palestinians uh, were also Christians, and um, imagine non-religious uh, at all. So uh, when we ta start talking about these issues, uh, it seems to be played out as though these are religious wars, and especially with Israel at this time, t talking more about uh, a theocratic state. Well. If I just may say something real quick, as, as much as the right wing call it a theocratic state or want to call it a theocratic oh, state, even the, even the the moderate and quote unquote left wing of Israel will call. I took I learned this in a political science class at Hebrew University, where they called Israel. They they define Israel as a, a demokratia ethnit, which when you translate that into English means an ethnic democracy. So. If you go by that definition, you can see that there's not a whole lot of room for movement, whether you're going to say it's a theocratic one or whether it's an ethnic one, because your ethnicity tends to fall in tr into lines with whatever kind of uh, cultures and beliefs and traditions and religions may, may be involved. So, mm -hmm. you want to add? Yeah, I mean, I think a little bit on, on I think the mm -hmm. early history of Israel, there was this image in, in the West that Israel was almost a, a socialist, uh, you know, right. utopia, and, and it was as democratic, but I think it was, it was a false image. Um, I think uh, there, there was a very small minority at, at the beginning in, 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 in early Zionism that had uh, argued for a binational state, that the, the way forward was for uh, Arabs and, uh, you know, uh, Israelis to actually uh, live in that kind of a state. But they were very marginalized. Uh, and actually both the, the labor Zionists and, you know, which we can, which 
this image came about that they were the socialist utopia and the right wing, which emerged a little bit later that we're really seeing culminating now. Even the labor Zionists, though, had this image of, of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of socialism for the, for the Jews of Israel, and that's it. So it always had this ethnic character uh, to it. And I think that's an important point to, to make because I don't think there's, there's a, a fundamental disagreement between the labor Zionists and the right-wing Zionists about the end goals. It's a matter of about the means. I think Ilan Pape, the Israeli historian, puts it well, which is the labor Zionists want a small Israeli state without any Arabs. Right. <laughs> the the right-wing Zionists want a larger Israeli state without any Arabs. At the heart of it, though, is still that racist idea that the indigenous population uh, doesn't deserve to be there or, or doesn't have a right to that state. Yeah. But there, wouldn't there also be said that there was, uh, um, in Israel, there are Palestinians who are Israeli citizens and they sit on the, on, on the, in the government? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, there is, absolutely. There, there, there are some, uh, a small amount of uh, Palestinian Israeli citizens who sit on the Knesset. Of course, their, their rights are very uh, limited. Uh, Azmi Bshara, who was a... Uh, who was uh, sat on the uh, Israeli Knesset and uh, uh, made, uh, he went and uh, visited with the, the state of Syria um, and, and made a solidarity statement with Syria and, and, and um, supported Hezbollah's uh, actions um, in, in, uh, in defending uh, Lebanon and was essentially forced out of Right. The, the country uh, for his political ideas. So there's an ability to participate in politics, but I think it's, it's very limited and there's a lot of pressure there. Yeah, the, the Israeli Communist Party is largely made up of, of far left Jews and Arabs. Um, Mohammed Bakra and Dov Hanin are both uh, prominent activists in terms of left wing and, and anti uh, wall solidarity movements. Dov Hanin goes to, uh, sometimes he goes to Neilin, sometimes he goes to Sheikh Jarrah, which is a uh, uh, neighborhood in East Jerusalem that's, that's being uh, under, a, under colonization from right wing settlers that's mm -hmm. proposed by the municipalities. Um, and uh, so each time something happens in, in terms of the political life and uh, 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 relation to the publics, they, the, the media tries to slant it in a way that um, Mohammed Bakr has all these legal, legal uh, uh, battles that he needs to fight because supposedly a, a uh, meter maid enraged him and there was a physical altercation or whatever nonsense it may be. So um, what's really amusing to see, however, is how it seems that now there's this popular wave of dissent that's that's taken inspiration from from Arab Spring and from Jasmine Revolution and all these all these uprisings in Libya and now there's a huge tent city. I mean, 300,000 people marching in Tel Aviv, 50,000 people marching in Jerusalem, 20,000 marching in Beersheba, 500 people marching in a place like Ashkelon or wherever it may be. You that's say 500. that's a lot of people. Pe people. That's a it, lot of people. It, it, you mean you're talking about Jews that are? Marching? I'm talking about Jews that are marching, marching that are upset with the way that 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 the the, the quality of life is there, how how things are going, and um and and uh, I think that um that's something that's really to be said, where people have just gotten up, said enough is enough, set up a tent city, and are working towards uh towards uh, towards a better end. It's, I, I don't necessarily think that it's the only end that they need to get to, but it's a step in the right direction. Well, since we brought that up and we w wanted to talk about it anyhow, is the Arab Spring, you know, and what this means to <clears throat> the uh, the hopes and aspirations of Palestinians uh, in this. Well, do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, I mean, I think that the Arab the Arab Spring is, is critical for uh, Palestinians, and there's always been a really close dynamic between the Palestinian uh, resistance uh, to Israeli colonization and the Arab resistance to imperial domination, uh, historically. Uh, but, but more importantly and concretely, just for taking Egypt, for example, right. Egypt was <coughs> very much complicit in the continued siege of Gaza. They controlled one of the borders that would have allowed uh, aid, all the needs of the Palestinian mm -hmm. uh, citizens of uh, Gaza to actually be there. But they kept that border sealed, um, and they've largely been complicit in, 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 in this uh, process. Uh, so have uh, the Saudis, so have the Jordanians. Of course, they often lip, you know, mouth uh, support for the Palestinian cause, while in reality, they've they've uh, supported the status quo because of their relationship to the United States. Now that that support 
has, uh, doesn't reflect the population. That, that, that those relationships with Israel doesn't reflect the actual uh, feelings of the people. The mass, mass majority of Arabs are very uh, in support of the rights of the Palestinians, but because the U.S. has supported <coughs> these dictators, um, they haven't been able to to actually fulfill uh, their you know their wishes to support the Palestinians. And I think now, as as these revolutions push forward, we can begin to see the the real democratic wishes of the people of the region, um, their support for the Palestinians being reflected in their state's policies. It's still very early in the process, uh, but but we can still we can begin to see it with Egypt. There's been a slight lessening of the uh, blockade on Gaza. They they've opened intermittently the border with uh, with. Um, with uh, Gaza, uh, so so there is a move in that direction, and I think the more the the, the Arab Revolution moves forward, uh, the more uh, the more Israel's situation in the region as a colonial state with a, 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 you know a Jewish population that has these privileges um, over the the Palestinians actually becomes less tenable, um, and 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 that weakening of Israel's. Uh, uh, relationship, you know, with, with the broader region, also makes it a very makes it less of a useful ally for American imperialism in the region because it's easy for Israel to smash a state, a military, but it's very difficult for them to do anything. It's much more difficult for them to do anything about popular revolutions. And if we can break Israel from U.S. imperialism, I think that's a real a, a real hope for a, 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 a way forward there. Yeah, since the <clears throat> since these uh, basically the uh, revolution in Egypt, uh, um, there's also been, like you said, the border's been kind of open and closed because the last time I saw it, they closed the borders on, on the, uh, Gaza again. So what what is happening there? I mean, we still have the uh, military that was in charge with uh, <clears throat> the previous government. So uh, is is that still being? Uh, um, I mean, how is the new form of government uh, changing things, or is it? Well, I think that that shows where the Egyptian revolution is at, which is Mubarak is gone. A few of the most uh, reviled figures in the Mubarak regime are gone, but for the most part, the regime that was there is still there. Uh, the military council was still very much part of the ruling elite and ruling class. Um, and, and we have to remember the military is funded to the tune of about two billion dollars um, by the United States. For, and, and the reason for that funding, of course, is it's not just charity. There's a specific uh, goal for that, and that's for the Egyptian military to make sure that the regional goals of the United States are carried out. Um, and, I, and I think there's popular pressure on the Egyptian military council, so they've had to make <coughs> some moves, but they, they are still very much part and, part, of, part and parcel of the status quo. Uh, they're still tied to American imperialism and, and, and subject to American uh, demands. Do, so. you, do you think that uh, the attacks on Libya played a part in that at all? I mean, there's a, I, I, I need to bring it up because uh, I was doing a workshop at the Veterans for Peace Conference, and we were looking at the comparison between uh, uh, Honduras and, and Libya, you know, um, the, the coup that took place there when the U.S. says, you know, we have nothing to do with it, but really the military, uh, they didn't do anything really to really condemn that. And, uh, uh, and there's a lot of strife, and, and just, I think, uh, uh, eight people were killed here just recently in Honduras. Uh, and the sort of opposition, which is nonviolent uh, opposition and with the campesinos. Uh, but uh, in this analysis I read on, on Libya is, you know, is, you know we always say uh, it's the oil, but uh, Gaddafi had already given up much of those oil resources to uh, contracts with uh, the military, especially after he, is, he had lost his daughter in uh, a bombing <coughs> with, under the Clinton administration, wasn't it? And, um, uh, and in fact, uh, they just showed something about McCain, McCain uh, 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 talking about Libya as a real partner in, uh, in, in government. These just came out on WikiLeaks recently. Um, Revolutions so, brought to you by McCain. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so the thing, the, the analysis was, well, why? Why now? Why all of a sudden? They had already made the deal with Gaddafi. He was. He was playing ball for the most part, you know, uh, as far as oil interests were going. 
but he wasn't playing ball on uh, a lot of other things. He wasn't going along with the austerity programs that were being enforced upon many nations. who were creating, I mean, that's part of what was happening in Egypt and is happening all over the world, in Spain, in Europe, you, you name it, uh, even in this country today. So uh, the analysis was is that why did NATO and the U.S. get involved here? Well, one thing is they really weren't involved. They weren't there in Bahrain. They weren't there to to help uh, uh, the demonstrators in Syria. They they uh, they certainly weren't there for the Egyptians, and the Egyptians didn't want them there. But at the same time, they weren't there. And this didn't start out as not a, a peaceful uh, uh, revolution. It started out asking for weapons and support, and uh, and so it seemed organized in a different way. And one of the analysis was is that. It's because they were losing control in Egypt and in some of these other countries that uh, because of their proximity to uh, uh, Israel, that it was important to maintain control of one of the Arab states and that the idea was that it wasn't about Gaddafi, it was about uh, their power and influence and a warning to further revolutions that might break out, uh, be warned. And that's why I'm asking the question, do you think that uh, that, that attack in Libya had some constraints upon the military in Egypt uh, at all, or had you even thought about it? I'm just, I know I just brought this, sprung this on. Right, right. I mean, I think that the constraints <clears throat> on the, I think, the, as far as the Egypt question, I think uh, it, it's it's not the attacks on Libya that constrained the military council and, and, and what, they, what they were willing to give to the people. I think, in general, the military council, uh, the and I'm talking about the generals here, the brass right. of the military, obviously, not not the the Soldier. soldiers in the military, but they don't want the revolution to go any further. Uh, they don't want the further radicalization of the revolution. Uh, they don't want p people to continue to protest. They can't give real they can't really solve the economic demands of the Egyptian people, which were at the heart of the protest there. Egypt was had huge amounts of disparity in wealth, huge amounts of inflation and the cost of food. They aren't able to solve those problems without fundamentally changing the economic system. And their privilege, their their rights depend on that system. So they are going to defend that system, but I think b b based on, and I think that's why there's been, you know, Lots of protests now that have come out and denounced the military uh, and, and said that we need to, you know, we need to move forward. We need to continue the protests. We need to deepen the revolution. Um, as far as Libya, though, I think we have to be, we have to be careful. I think, I think what you said about why the United States and NATO have intervened, they're absolutely right in the sense that, um, well, I'll get to that. But I think, I think we have to be careful about how the Libyan revolution started. I yeah. think we can say that in Libya, the revolution started as, as, as a more mass, uh, popular revolution, very similar and inspired by what was happening in Tunisia and Egypt and across uh, the Arab world and North Africa. But um, it, it did change. I mean, the, the, the very ruth, ruthless response by uh, Gaddafi uh, did lead to an arming of uh, sections of the rebels. Now, um, I, I think what you said about these, these contradictions of why the United States intervened are absolutely right. The United States has absolutely no interest, neither does NATO, in helping any kind of democratic right, freedom. But the, the reason <clears throat> the United States went in was because they saw that there was, now that, that this was an armed uh, resistance, the mass of the population had 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 you know returned home. There was an opportunity for them to be able to to essentially take a section of the opposition, lift them up, um, and and in in the hopes of bringing them to power. And honestly, bringing somebody into power who's a little bit more stable for them than Gaddafi. Yes, Gaddafi had had signed on to the American imperial project to a certain degree, but he was a little bit too crazy for them. They saw an opportunity for them to put somebody else in power that was more stable, that can that can fulfill their interests. But also, there's an ideological function that I think is really important, which is they wanted to um, rescue their image and their ability to intervene in the Middle East that's, through a humanitarian argument. I think that's, that's crucial. I think you're absolutely right there. I mean, that, that, the same sort of questions go to Israel. It's there, I mean, there, uh, um, and I, I'm not talking about Libya now, but I mean, the idea that people interest to stay in power are so strong uh, that even when there's resistance by the Israeli people, the, the, the Israeli demonstrators uh, are, 
are uh, under threat. Uh, and we were talked about the last time about the Israeli boycott and that people, right. this was uh, against the law for Jews right. to... Right, Israeli citizens and, yeah. uh, and, and other organizations to basically call for a boycott of products that are make, made in occupied land, whether it's the Golan Heights, whether it's wine that comes from Golan Heights or snacks that come from a West Bank factory. Um, and uh, the, uh, uh, what's, what's really striking to me now, particularly after last week with this attack that's happened on the, the, the Egyptian border, um, the focus is shifting. I mean, it's always shifting to something that's going to, and it, is, these are the same people, the same names, it's Ahud Barak, who's like the, the, you know, the left wing guy, who's defense minister, who's saying that, you know, we all, we, we really need to focus on what's happened here. There's a lot to be learned and we have to be careful um, uh, what's happening. Um, we, could, we could definitely go into Gaza and do a whole bunch of uh, bad um, or good, depending upon however, which way that they're gonna be looking at it. But what I believe and what makes sense to me, knowing from my background, is that it would make, it would be a, 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 a tragedy um, to have a massive uh, Egyptian buildup in Sinai. Which is actually a UN uh, a, a draft in the UN in terms. Of, oh wait, no, in Camp David process, or some one of those treaties that don't hold a bit of tinder block for anyone's accountability. Um, he, the, the the idea is to have to have Egyptian troops inside Sinai or close to Gaza is is closer to Gaza is preferable than to actually have them in the Sinai Peninsula. Um, so the uh the the powers that be that uh, in the military some of the, what, what i was talking about with the egyptians and their elite brass wanting to hold on to things they're going to say that we need to focus more on sp defense spending on uh on budgeting for warfare which is the same thing that's always been on the table each time that the u.s's check comes through for the three billion dollars which we use to buy goods in israel mm -hmm. from the u.s and all these other, uh, it, it's, it's, it's just, a, it's, it's, well, I'm not going to say the word, but um, mm -hmm. it's, it's circular. Right. And those in the know will know what that means. Um, so I think that when you, uh, when, when, you look at, when you look at the shift in focus from the media, when you have thousands of people out on the streets who are demanding change and no one's, and it's not happening, and you have these attacks and you have the same people saying, we need, we need this money now for defense budgeting, there's an absolute, uh, lack of uh, 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 relationship between the people that are in power because they've been in it for so long and the people on the street who have difficulty feeding their kid. Interesting to know, in Palestine, in Palestinian villages and cities, people don't sleep on the streets. People have a place to go at night. And I don't, I don't think I've ever seen a homeless person in Palestine. In Israel, there are whole sections of cities where people are strung out on heroin, where people are, uh, uh, are out homeless, where there are, children are starving. And I'm not saying that the Palestinian situation is so much better than the Israelis, <clears throat> but given the fact that Israel has so much power and so much money, and the focus is on defense, 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 and it allows people to starve and to fail within life, I think that that is something to say amongst the people who don't have as much, who are oppressed, and don't allow for other well, there's people a, to, I mean, there, to pass Again, from, if I refer to this book a little bit, uh, I mean, uh, <clears throat> Alice uh, Rothschild was uh, a physician, but she also went into psychiatry, and, and they were talking about, you know, I'm a post-traumatic stress uh, <clears throat> Vietnam veteran, um, and when you're when you're in a position uh, as in the military and you're under these various traumas, as as the people both sides are uh, under this trauma, they were talking about uh, the trauma of Israelis at checkpoints and in various areas uh, that already had come to sort of a conclusion. They be, they felt this was wrong, mm -hmm. but they you know this is went against all the ideals that they were taught as they were growing up. And uh, but they had to serve. It's by law. They have to serve in the military. And, and they, she was talking about how many were, uh, even though they, you have to do be in the reserves after you've served mm -hmm. uh, for ten years. Isn't that correct? Up to forty-five. Forty-five years. You have to be up to forty. Age from age, age, age twenty-one till forty-five. <clears throat> yeah. okay. So that uh, a lot of the people were actually coming in, saying that they were trying to get out. They were having. Uh, basically post-traumatic stress. They were basically having mental problems, uh, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> psychological problems, and a lot of drug use right. uh, to deal with these issues that were, these internal conflicts in their, in their mind, in their body. And so 
Uh, again, one of the things you know, the 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 in the Egyptian uh, revolution, one of the praises was that the army didn't really fire on the protesters. Now, I don't know what the generals may or may not have ordered, but <clears throat> in same similar things happened in like in Venezuela, you know, when Hugo Chavez was under attack. Uh, the military stood behind the people on, on uh, uh, <clears throat> trying to maintain his power. There was a break within the military. Um, as Vietnam veterans, I mean, many veterans became uh, GI resistors. They were at the forefront of, of the anti-war movement in, uh, uh, during the 1960s. Much of it, uh, that history totally wiped out in our history books. And you got a good movie for anybody who hasn't seen it is Sir No Sir. Uh, it tells a history of the Vietnam uh, uh, GI resistance movement, Vietnam veterans against the war, and is uh, critical. Uh, even when I was in uh, Vietnam, I myself was involved in, uh, I would say, a mutiny. We refused to move when they told us to move, and and, uh, <clears throat> and I've talked to many Iraq and Afghan vets who were told to go out into the field in certain areas, and basically they'll go in some place in shade and play like they're doing this stuff and they're not doing it. It's their way of resisting uh, being sent into uh, suicide missions, you know, or into a situation where they ha may have to kill a civilian or, or g get mixed up with people. Mm -hmm. And um, so there's a sort of resistance that's going on. I, I, Iraq veterans against the war, um, uh, Vietnam veterans against the war and veterans for peace. These were a number of veterans that are starting to say no. And if if Israeli soldiers, we had the refuseniks, who were uh, some of the first that are saying, as soldiers, they would no longer participate in this. You had the, what was it, the, the teenage kids, what was that called? Uh, the the Sheministim, the, the ones that, that, that sign a refusal to serve and they'd rather go serve in uh, their stint in jail and then be released. Yeah, and, then, and many of them had gone to jail. And how, oh, yeah. what's, the, what's the period of time for that they had to go to It certain? varies. It varies between each individual. Um, some people go for three months, some people go for six months, some people have served nine months. There's a really good movie that was developed by, uh, that was produced by uh, Dialogues Against Militarism and the San Francisco branch of the IVAW um, called uh, Occupation Has No Future, but I don't think that that's out in public. But what, you're, what you were saying, which, which brought which I think is really important to know for everyone to know is that in America there is still deployment of soldiers that have experienced PT, that have PTSD, That's right. have mil military sexual trauma, and IVAW has a campaign called um, uh, Operation Recovery, Recovery that they're trying to that they're trying to bring and raise uh, awareness around that. And November, come November, Veterans Day, the the national chapter is trying to focus on. Uh, military sexual trauma as a whole, um, and that's and that's what we we also had at the last convention here, just here in August, was the basic uh, uh, a lot of things on uh, military sexual trauma workshops on mm -hmm. post traumatic stress. It was more or less the theme of the conference this year, uh, and one of the things that people don't realize is that um, uh, in the redeployment of of these veterans, um, uh, risking life of their fellow soldiers uh, with the <clears throat> attitudes. Uh, uh, there are actually suicides in, uh, in uh, among women. Uh, I guess is the highest rate of women in country mm -hmm. that are committing suicide. Right. Um, <clears throat> so we'll, we don't know if it's all sexual trauma, just the, the whole idea of betrayal and the idea of being redeployed. I can't, I can't imagine these, the, just the thing I was just reading to you earlier, that they're going to be doing a striker force that uh, they're redeploying uh, uh, more soldiers to Afghanistan. And these are people who had, some had already served and some are uh, be fresh to be doing it, but they're going to be separated from their families and being sent to a country at a, at a, a rate at a, a, in a war or a zone in which most of the people of America are now against, you know. Uh, these, are the, these are unpopular uh, actions or occupations. I wouldn't even call them war, they're, they're yeah. occupations. And, um, so if soldiers would, would do what, what many of the GI resistors did in the 1960s was refuse to serve anymore, refuse to cooperate. And part of the idea is, for me, you know, Operation Recovery is the idea of, of uh, uh, not, resent, not resenting somebody who's been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress. And right. almost anybody that served one or two tours would have post-traumatic stress, oh, yeah. therefore they couldn't resend them, therefore it stops them from going. Uh, 
<clears throat> but the, if the soldiers themselves would refuse to serve, if we had a, somehow can raise the consciousness and awareness of people in this country, we had the, the uh, anti-draft movement in the 1960s where people refused to serve and uh, soldiers then began to desert. And if we start looking at that, I'm not advocating that people should desert, but that they can say, no, I will no longer serve. I'm a conscience objector. I do not believe this. They have to know their rights. IVAW and Veterans for Peace can tell people what their rights are. Know your rights. Right. Uh, you can change your mind. Uh, uh, when you, if you come to a conclusion that, you know, that these wars are unjust, unfair, and, <clears throat> and you shouldn't be there, if Israelis can do that, if Israelis say, you know, they don't think these wars are right, right. Uh, how can w these wars or occupations exist without the cooperation of the military, of the, of the military right. and, the, and the individual citizen? I mean, because they're citizens before they become soldiers. Right. Well, if I could touch on that. Um, I think for me, my biggest, my biggest break in, in uh, my killing streaks, um, the absolute break, was when I was, I had sat for a second and I had realized that, I, I, when, when I was serving, I didn't serve, I didn't like government, but I knew that people would get blown up on buses. I survived two suicide attacks myself. Um, and for me, and while well, I was in downtown Tel Aviv, in Jerusalem also, so I, for me it's, it's, it's something about people. And then I, I was thinking, well, maybe if I get this one, one last one last person, you know, and I take them out, maybe 20 people will live. And then, you know, I worked on that rationale for years. And then I thought for a second, well, wait, hold on a second. What if that same person that I'm, that's downrange from me, is looking at me and saying, man, maybe I get this one soldier, 50 people from my village are gonna live, right? So the similarities and the commonalities between the person that picks up the gun and fights for something that has to do more so on a basic level of people, but misinterpret it as something else, I think is much more widespread than just saying, uh, especially in this fast generation of we have, you know, generation kill, we have these video games, this mm -hmm. whole, the sanctity of life means something completely different. Um, so for me, I thought, I can't kill that guy because that person is me, because I believe in the same thing that I believe, and that rationale makes me neutral to him, and in fact, I see more of him uh, in me than I do of the people that made this situation and the situations that gave rise to the circumstances of where we're firing at each other. Mm -hmm. And I, that's how I feel that that has, that has to start that way, and every citizen can get to that point because no one wants Joe Law banging on their door and telling them, we need whatever it is that's in your house because the law says so, you know? Right. And that's and 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 it's not it's not that far of a stretch for people to get there. Um, it all it all bases back on you know respect and what your rights are and what you your liberties are supposed supposed to be. Right. Um, I yeah. want I want to we we're gonna it's actually going by pretty fast and and um, again it's never enough time to to talk about all these issues. But uh, I want to get back to a topic. I just told you that uh, uh, Veterans Peace uh, uh, passed a resolution. Uh, it was 2011-14, I believe, uh, which was basically saying that uh, it supported the right of Palestinian self-determination. Um, it mentioned that that uh, uh, there may be other alternatives to than the two-state solution. Uh, all my years, I'm, I mean, I'm I, I converted to Judaism uh, uh, during the period of uh, sort of the time when my son was uh, going through serious uh, health conditions, and. <clears throat> And I found the literature, I was in Reform Judaism, and people they, they don't know there are a number of different groups of, uh, of Judaism. And, uh, uh, and I converted to Judaism uh, based on uh, these philosophical ideas of what it meant to be a human being, and not what it meant to be a Jew, you know? Mm -hmm. and, uh, <clears throat> and it was very profound to me. And once I realized that uh, being, uh, any religion might have taught me that, but that, that that's where I found it, I found that I had to learn how to be a human being, and that's where the real thing I had to carry in my heart. I didn't need organized religion anymore. I didn't need Judaism. Mm -hmm. I didn't need Christianity or anything, uh, because I just realized that all I needed to do was was to understand that we are part of that family. 
Um, but the idea, I was involved with a group called um, a New Jewish Agenda, and we used to support the idea of a two-state solution. And uh, we, I mean, we were uh, called self-hating Jews. Uh, you know, it was very difficult to work within the the, uh, the mainstream Jewish community uh, on these ideas. Uh, but we were able to break through. So we had an idea that we would be uh, progressive, uh, progressives within the Jewish community and Jews within the progressive community. Um, <clears throat> and so these were sort of things to, that, that was very profound in, in talking about two-state solution, but now there's on the table the idea of one-state solution. And there's this idea of going before the UN, right, uh, and uh, asking for that, for the idea of being recognized as a Palestinian state. But isn't that still a two-state solution? One is, I, I, I'm having trouble understanding yeah. the difference here, and I, I would appreciate some it, clarification. It, yeah, it, it's not even a two-state solution. I mean, I, I think that's, the, you know, the, this, this bid for Palestinian statehood, as it's being kind of dubbed in, in the United Nations, uh, which would be recognition by the UN, uh, or membership by Palestine um, in the UN. Uh, I mean, I, I think it's... It, at the very least, I think it, it's it, it's confusing um, because it doesn't change anything. I think the occupation continues, the roadblocks uh, continue, the wall continues. Nothing on the ground changes, but all of a sudden you have recognition of a state that doesn't exist. But there's a great resistance to that recognition of state. Well, I think I think that re that that resistance shows the levels to which the United States and Israel are willing to go to to you know to, to denounce any kind of idea of a Palestinian state. But I think at the end of the day, even if there is recognition of a Palestinian state, I think we have to be very careful what that means. Uh, I think there's there, there's been we we look back. There's been UN UN resolutions that have recognized a real solution that everybody in the world, you know, <laughs> you know, every every Supporting. nation has, has supported, yet that hasn't changed the situation on the ground. I think there's some very real power dynamics. Uh, the fact that Israel, uh, you know, uh, per capita income is about 25000 per year in Israel compared to about, you know, $2,000 in the West Bank, about six hundred in, in Gaza. Mm -hmm. uh, it's probably the fifth, fourth largest military in the world, highly advanced um, uh, military, absolutely no military, you know, <laughs> a couple, you know, some, some rocket, some homemade rockets, some Kalashnikovs in, in the West Bank and Gaza, um, and you have nuclear weapons. So I think there's a massive power dynamic that I think doesn't change with this recognition. And I think one of the dangers is if, if, if the, this recognition goes through is that, okay, well, now you have a Palestinian state. Look at Mahmoud Abbas is sitting in the United Nations with a placard in front of us that says Palestine on it. But in the reality, on the ground, nothing changes. And even Mahmoud Abbas has said, after we get this recognition, we have to go back and negotiate with, with Israel. So, uh, Well, there, I mean, one of the, one of the uh, critiques that somebody was, was raising, uh, because we had, the, the, when putting forward this resolution at Veterans for Peace Conference, was you know, basically saying, let the Palestinians uh, uh, decide what is important for them. We're not going to... It shouldn't be that the U.S. is employing that in the outside nations, but uh, to bring people around in solidarity with the idea that people have a right to exist. Um, but I, when I was writing uh, a friend uh, who's <clears throat> not a religious Jew, but uh, had been in Egypt and Uganda, Israel, and is, he, he says, be sure that when you're doing this program that, that, that night, that this means that Israel has a right to exist uh, also, you know? And so when we talk about Palestinians' uh, right to self-determination, how do we talk about uh, Israelis uh, this is a, <clears throat> to be self, their own self-determination and their, their view? When we begin talking about this, this is where we come down to these basic conflicts over and over again. How do we talk about these things? I mean, one of the, uh, the, when I heard, first heard of one-state solution, the one-state solution was the idea that Israel would become the whole place would become one state, democratic state, and all citizens were recognized equal. That's the high ideal. Uh, so, I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I think that's part of what this 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 UN recognition. Part of the danger is it's going to codify this this two state solution, which I think is is 
highly unjust at best. It only addresses a certain portion of the Palestinian population, one third of it really, those who live in the West Bank and Gaza. It does nothing to um, fix the, the situation for the 1.2 million Palestinians in Israel who live as second class citizens, let alone the, the Palestinian refugees who have under the most basic fundamental Geneva Convention a right to, to return to their homes uh, that they were forced from. So I think it does, there is the danger of kind of codifying. But, but how, do we, how do we create a, a so how, how does uh, what other proposals or alternatives are being put on the table that, that both sides can live with and both sides exist? Well, I mean, I think when it comes to situations, I think, of colonization, an oppressor and, and an oppressed, I, I, don't, I, I don't think we, we take into an account what the, the oppressor side can live with. <laughs> you know, but well, because, for instance, would we, ask, would we have asked the South African white population what they could have lived with? Lived with um, well, they would have said apartheid. <laughs> Fantastic. That's what we'll stay with. But I think they didn't. We have, I mean, Absolutely. But they didn't. They did stay in power, and they shared power in in South Africa. And well, I think they were forced to. They, to they that. were. So yes, I think. I think you know whatever solution that we look at. I think yeah. the important thing is we have to actually address that fundamental dynamic. I think there's three historic injustices that the Palestinians um, have faced. The 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 Palestinians that have been forced. Um, that are refugees, their right to return, the, the end to the occupation um, in the West Bank and Gaza, and the Palestinians uh, in, that, in Israel that live as second-class citizens, those things need to end. I think what we need to do is we actually need to pressure Israel to end it. Now, obviously, our government right now is not willing to do that, but there is, you know, boycott, divestment, sanctions is one of the ways that people can participate to actually help force that pressure and, and, and address this power dynamic. That's one way. Another way we're seeing it happen already is the Arab Spring, which is shaf shifting the power dynamic. Right, right. Um, and I think that's also very important. And of course, another dynamic which is, has continued, it goes ups and down, is the Palestinian popular resistance inside of Palestine. Yeah, there's only, there's only, there's, the one solution is a one-state solution. There's no, there's, no other, there's no other way to get around it. There's no, there's no way that you can have two separate states, two different economic systems that are all based off of injustice. You have to have one solution, one one state, and, and and that's it. And maybe maybe things will work out. I'd assume that it would. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, for me, I'm, I I also think a one state solution is critical. Okay. Uh, well, that's a, that. Again, that's gonna that still keeps those tensions going. I think that you know we're, that's the ideal for me too. I mean. First of all, the idea for me is that there's no nation states. <laughs> we get rid of these ideas uh, and we become uh, citizens of the world and uh, we learn to work uh, regionally and, and uh, uh, geographically for how those economic systems might work and let's get rid of these notions. That to me would be the best way to go. Uh, we're going to have to end the program. I'm sorry that we had to have <laughs> even more time because there's no way we're going to solve this uh, here in this little room. But I'm glad to have you both here. I want to thank you again. Thank Zach, you so much for having on. us, Dan. Well, yeah, you, Dan. Ple pleasure to have you here. I mean, you really brought wonderful perspective for people out there. I mean, uh, the clarification for both of you on these ideas. Um, I'm glad you both have.